All right, good afternoon. So our next speaker is a woman of impact who expresses her perspective by writing best-selling books. Nonetheless, she's also a powerful speaker too. And the person I'm talking about is none other than Julie Lyka Haynes. Julie believes in humans and is deeply interested in what gets in our way. She's a New York Times best-selling author of the Anti-Helicopter, Parenting Manifesto, How to Raise an Adult, which gave rise to a TED Talk that has more than 5 million views. Her second book is the critically acclaimed and award-winning prose poetry memoir, Real American, which illustrates her experience as a Black and biracial person. In White Spaces, a third book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, is also out now. Julie is a former corporate lawyer and Stanford dean, and she holds a BA from Stanford, a JD from Harvard, and an MFA in writing from California College of the Arts. She serves on the board of Common Sense Media and on the advisory board of Leaning.org, and she's a former board member at Foundation for a College Education, Global Citizen Year, The Writer's Grotto, and Challenge Success. She also volunteers at the hospital program No One Dies Alone. And today, Julie will be speaking on the importance of listening to your own voice and honoring what you hear. And after that, the audience will also have the opportunity to ask Julie their own questions. So without further ado, the stage is all yours, Julie. Thank you for that introduction, Karsten. Nicole, thank you for reaching out and inviting me to be a part of your wonderful event today. I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. I know you've been at this for a long time this morning. I hope it has been a wonderful event. Um, I'm really honored to get to be with you. I'd love to see more people put in the chat where they're from. I'm seeing Morocco, Indonesia, Kenya, Dubai, um, everybody else who hasn't yet answered that question, put it in there because it's just lovely to see um, the global nature of this event. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I wanna give a shout out to you as a generation. You appear, as far as I can tell, you are largely Gen Z, Jamaica, India. And um, just as Demoye was singing about in her beautiful song with her beautiful voice, beautiful lyrics, there is something incredibly combustive about your generation. You are making things happen. You are not sitting around waiting. You are not sitting by the wayside. You're not waiting for people older than you to make things happen. You seem to have come into this world knowing that time is urgent, that circumstances are in many respects um, highly problematic, if not dire. And you've decided as a generation, hey, it's on us. We're going to do something about this. I'm Gen X. I'm 53. So I am standing from a much older place, looking at you all with admiration and with respect, and also with an interest in trying to support you in being who you are intrinsically. So I have this new book that just came out about three months ago called Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. And I haven't yet sold it around the world. I don't know if it's going to be possible for you to get it in your country. It is on Amazon, but I'm not sure what that necessarily means in terms of global sales. But regardless of the book, this is me in a very big book with compassion for young people saying, I know it may be scary, I know you may be terrified. I'm, I know you may feel that you don't know how to be an adult because that's what a lot of young people are saying, but I'm here older, farther down the path of life, shining a warm light back at you to just illuminate the possibilities and some of the pitfalls and to try to help you make better decisions earlier on than I was able to do when I was your age. So that's kind of where my work comes from. Um, um, as Karsten indicated in introducing me, my career has been law, and then I was a dean at Stanford University, meaning I looked after uh, many aspects of the student experience, um, and now I'm a writer and speaker full-time, and I'm a mom. I have a 22-year-old son and a 19-year-old daughter, and um, so that's, that's sort of where my work comes from. I have a deep compassion for humans. Um, many of us do. My compassion I'm fairly certain comes from the fact that when I was born, my black father and white mother were transgressing the rules of society by daring to fall in love, daring to be married, daring to have me. 
right? I'm 53. And to be mixed race then in 1967, when I was born, was to be not just an oddity, but problematic. Um, and so I come from people who broke society's rules um, in order to fall in love and be in love and, and bring me into the world. And so I think who I am is informed by that rebelliousness, by that transgressiveness. Society's rules and norms um, are often excluding so many of us from full participation. And I came into this world insisting, no, 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 I, you know, I want to matter. And I'm going to do my darndest to try to matter, regardless of what other people think of me. Um, I want to share with you a quote from a wonderful poet who died recently, an American poet named Mary Oliver. In one of her poems, she says, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I want you to sit with that. I want you to continually be asking yourself that today and next week and next year. And as you age, I'm still asking myself that. I think it's a really important question that should always be there beckoning us, reminding us it's your one wild and precious life. It's yours. It's not anybody else's. It's yours to do with what you will. And I'm interested for all of us in what we want out of our one wild and precious life and in what gets in the way of us living that life. Let's face it, particularly when we're young, often our minds are filled with the voices of other people, our parents, our extended family members, our whole ethnic community, our peers, society, media, influencers, all of those voices are in our head telling us you should do this. Oh, don't do that. You ought to be a this. Oh, don't do that. Um, in a personal realm, these are the people we want you to marry. Don't marry them, <clears throat> right? This is the person we think you are. You're not of that. So we have all this noise in our heads that's developed over years that we're trying to accommodate. Oh, I'm supposed to be this. I'm supposed to love these people. I'm supposed to do this work. But I'm here rooting for all of us and especially young people on the cusp of becoming your adult selves to say, okay, that's other people's judgment or other people's opinions, other people's expectations, but who am I? What do I want? I want you to ask yourself these questions. What do I wanna do with my one wild and precious life? Another way to ask it is, what would I do or what would I choose, whether for work or what to study or with whom to be in love, if it was just up to me? What would I do if it was just up to me? You can safely ask yourself that in your own mind and you must because your own psyche, spirit, soul, being, heart, wherever you think these innermost pieces of information lie, that self of yours will tell you the answer to that question. What would I do if it was only up to me? If nobody else was judging or if no one else's opinion mattered, what would I do? What would I choose? The better you get at asking yourself that question, the louder the answer will come within your self and then you'll be able to drown out increasingly the expectations and judgment and needs of all these other people who may love you very much. Yes. And whose life is it? Yours. Okay. It's your life. And it will be marvelous and impactful and joyful if you can find the courage to listen to your own voice and then. Honor what it tells you. I want to be of this. I want to study this. I want to be in relationship with this person. Okay. So I'm here rooting for that to happen. Some of us feel like a little dog on a leash dragged down the path of life by a parent or auntie, uncle, grandparent society's expectations, right? We are dragged toward the career, 
um, the life other people have in mind for us. And I'm here to say you are not a pet on a leash. You are not someone else's property. You are your own wild and precious being. And I want you to get out there and be who you are and get better at being who you are. I was, um, I'm gonna, I'm going to close by telling you a brief bit of my personal journey. Um, how am I doing on time, Nicole? Do I have time for five more minutes of story before Q&A? When you have enough time, don't worry, take your time. It's fine. Okay. Um, when you bring us someone who speaks for a living to, <laughs> to a seminar, a webinar, I tend to take a long time. I'll try to keep it short. Okay, so he, uh, just a brief bit of my journey um, because it informs the advice I'm trying to give you. So I came into this world as black biracial kid, very light skinned, uh, but in America, at least, uh, when you have skin this color, you are definitely not white and the many white people um, find you problematic. That was my reality. I grew up in white spaces. My father was a physician. And um, so I was often the only child of color in my entire school, in my neighborhood, all of that. And um, I learned from a very young age that something was wrong with my black daddy and with me too. I learned that at about age three or four, just from the nasty looks of strangers as daddy and I would walk down the street. And that began to worry me and it began to trouble me. And then I would have experiences in schools where I would be excelling and my teacher would refuse to put me in the higher um, level of whatever class it was. And even though I was tested and they were, they could prove that I was capable, my teacher um, just uh, just refused to see what, what I was clearly capable of doing and even taunted me about it. Um, and so I grew up with these messages. Um, I, in an all white high school, my best friend um, was watching a really racist movie um, from the time set, set in the era of slavery. And it was just fancy white women and slaves. And it's a movie called Gone with the Wind. And this is my white best friend and I'm 15. And she turns to me, I come to her house. She's watching the movie like on Netflix. It wasn't Netflix then, but effectively. And um, she goes, wouldn't it have been great to have lived back then? And she's looking at her screen, like pointing to the women in the fancy clothes. And I said, no. And she said, why not? And I said, because I would have been a slave. And she said, no, but I mean, if you weren't black. And I said, but I am black. And she said, oh, I don't think of you as black. I think of you as normal. And she thought she was giving me a compliment, y'all. She thought she was saying, oh, those black people are problematic, but don't worry, I see you as normal. I didn't take it as a compliment. I knew it wasn't a compliment. And so I grew up with all these messages of you're problematic, you're not smart, you know, you're, you're or you are an exception to the, to the problem that is blackness. All of these messages were in my head. And finally, on my 17th birthday in my all white high school, somebody wrote the N word on my birth, on my locker, um, on a beautiful sign that my best friend had put on my locker. I don't know if y'all have lockers in your high schools, um, but you know, this metal locker five feet tall where I kept my books and belongings. And she had put a beautiful birthday sign paper with cutouts of imagery from magazines and, you know, sort of like a paper version of Instagram. And it was this beautiful gift that was on my locker five feet long. And sometime during the day, um, somebody had come along with a black marker and written the N word and spelled it wrong, spelled it with only one G, um, but, they, but I knew what they meant. And, um, and I just, I was a student body president of my all white high school and successful and had a, was on, you know, important clubs and excelling academically. And, you know, I was just, you know, like at the top of my game, senior year, 17, feeling beautiful, feeling smart, feeling accomplished. And this stranger whose name I still do not know wrote the N-word on my birthday sign. And what happened is I didn't tell anybody because I was so ashamed at that point to be the brown kid or the black kid in these white spaces. I was too ashamed at that point of myself to speak up, to say anything to the school, to say anything to a teacher, to say anything to my parents. I just shrank and hid. I took the sign home because I wanted to put it in my scrapbook. It is still in my scrapbook, but I cut out the bad words um, uh, before putting it in my scrapbook. In fact, I had, when I noticed the bad words on my locker, I'd gone to the office and gotten a black marker to cover up the words with like, with just, drawing over it with a permanent marker. 
And so I never told anybody until I was 44. And I spent the years from teenagehood until my late 30s just trying to never be called the N-word again, just trying to please white folks, just trying to be the person they valued. So I went to law school to try to be a lawyer who would help people and make a difference in the world, You know, be an advocate for those who need an advocate, who don't have a voice, who are marginalized and oppressed. I went to law school for that reason, but I can tell you now with clarity, I was so insecure as a young woman of color at an elite law school in the United States that even though I went to law school to help people, I left law school with a job offer to go into corporate law, which is not about helping people. It's about helping corporations battle each other over much more trivial things in my view. And I was well paid and good at it and being mentored and applauded. And everybody thought I was successful and I was miserable inside. Why? Because even though I was well paid and doing well and well regarded and the work was not in line with my values, I was good at it but I did not love it. And that's when I learned how essential it is. And this is my message for you. And then we'll open up to questions. Your work must be both what you're good at and you love. I'm making like a little Venn diagram overlap. Like there's the circle of what you're good at and the circle of what you love. And there's some overlap there. Okay. You're looking for that overlap. If you're good at it, but you don't love it, you'll feel like a drone in your own life right? If you're great at math and everyone says, oh, you should go into engineering. You should, 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 right? All those voices in your head telling you what to do. Oh, you should do this. Yes. If you love engineering and you're good at the components that comprise it, go do that. That will be rewarding. But if you're good at it and don't love it, you're going to look up at 35 or 45 and say, what am I doing? Where did my life go? And of course, if you just love it and don't also have a propensity for it and don't have a likelihood of getting better at it with hard work, that's not going to be your career. It's going to be your hobby. You have to be good at it as well as loving it for it to be your work. So that's my message. Listen to that voice. Get better at listening to that little voice in your head telling you why you are on the planet, the work you want to do, the stuff you're good at, the stuff you love. Let your own sense of self answer those questions. When I finally came, and think about the obstacles that are in your way. When I finally came to terms with the fact that I was running from racism, that I was constantly just trying to be the black person that would not incur the disdain of white folks that would not lead to them mistreating me. When I finally turned around and faced that within myself, I freed myself. I liberated myself from that oppression. I stopped trying to be what they valued and just began being me. And that happened when I was about 39 and now I'm 53. So I'm just here to say, I hope you get there sooner than I did. You have so much promise. You are here for a reason. And I am rooting for you to figure that out and to make your way unimpeded by any obstacles on the outside of you or within. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. That was literally so beautiful. The words you, you know, you were so bold for, you know, sharing your experiences with us. And I'm so grateful that you did so because, um, you know, as long as you're not a person of color, you do not know what that, what the, op, what, the what, what people of color go through. And it's uh, deaf. And, you know, the, the fact that black people have had to suffer for, uh, for all their life, I mean, even uh, up to this day, I mean, you know, racism is something we've learned in our history textbooks. When I was back in third grade, I had a topic to learn called racism. And I was like, oh, cool, what is racism about? And, you know, uh, eight years later, I mean, uh, now I'm 16. And to see racism happening in our world today, it's literally, you know, it breaks my heart to, to see that, you know, there are people that are, you know, Uh, being penalized and being oppressed for what they are, something that's unchangeable, something that they're born with. It's actually disgusting that, you know, that there are people out there who, you know, think this way. And I just hope that with this webinar, with people like you, we can keep empowering one another to not be racist. And, you know, that racist jokes are not cool anymore. I mean, 
uh, I understand that, you know, when we're in school, that's the time of our lives, you know, we, we want to try to impress one another, we want to be as cool as possible, we want to have the most number of friends. And, you know, in the midst of doing that, we all we forget our own values, we go ahead and make terrible jokes, you know, without regarding, you know, another person's feelings. And I'm pretty sure all of us have experienced that. Uh, we could have been the people doing that, or we could have been the ones, you know, ex been the victims, you know, experiencing this. And uh, I, my message to um, all of you guys here, all the attendees here is that, you know, never get peer pressured into doing something. I understand that, you know, high school and college can be a time where, you know, we, we want to fit in, we want to be in that friend circle, we want to show that, you know, hey, I have a lot of friends here. And, you know, with that, we become, we sort of, you know, lose our, uh, our, our, our sense of value at that point in time. And, you know, that's something which I really don't want to do that. And I'm pretty sure many of us have made that mistake, you know, being around with our friends, we have said a mean and hurtful things to other people. And I just hope that all of us, you know, have learned from this. And now I'd like to give the opportunity to all of you guys to uh, ask questions to Julie. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box or you can put it in the Q&A uh, section over here. So uh, I'll just wait for two minutes. I need you guys to put in your questions that we can ask Julie because by far this has already been a very, very, very interesting conversation. So uh, any questions, please put it up here immediately. Okay, cool. So we have a uh, Ria with a question and Ria is right here. So Ria, you can unmute and you can you know, ask your question out loud. Thank you, Nicole, for that. So Julie, since you were the former Dean of Stanford University and since it's also time for us seniors to start applying to universities, what are some tips for international students, especially like me, to help navigate through the admissions process for US colleges? And what is one mistake you may have noticed students constantly make, which you can advise us not to make during the application process? Hi, Ria. Um, uh, thanks for asking that question on behalf of yourself and anyone else who's in that same stage of life approaching college and university. Um, I was the Dean of Freshmen, which meant that um, once the students were admitted and came, my job was to run an office that really tried to look after the first year students and make sure they were knowing the resources and the supports and knew that we were there for them and giving good advice. Um, so I wasn't an admissions person, but, uh, but that said, um, what US colleges and universities are looking for um, beyond the scores and grades, the test scores and the marks and grades from school, we're very much looking in that personal essay that the set of essays you write, we're looking for you. We're looking to find you. Like, where is, where are they? Like, where is, who is this human being? What is their character? What is their personality? And so I urge you not to write essays that are just narrating what you've done I did this, I did this, this was a, you know, like, don't just turn it into a narrative of your resume. Actually write an essay about you. Not, oh, I'm so amazing, but just, you know, just pick something small that matters to you, that demonstrates your character, your personality, you know, things you've experienced. Just pick something that you can, that you know well about yourself because it will reveal you. It is very much, in, in other countries, it's often just about grades and scores. In the US, we're deeply interested in the human being in the fullness of that concept. So um, it may be a bit of a stretch for some of you who are not comfortable um, sharing about yourself. We, we want that, we're asking you for that. And your letters of recommendation should be written by people, not the most famous person you know, but the person who knows you well. So a teacher you've had maybe in a few classes who has seen your growth, a coach or a mentor who has seen you develop from a younger child into the um, young adult you are now, who can really write about your journey, your growth, who you are, what you will bring to a campus. A lot of people make the mistake of, oh, I know somebody in the ministry of whatever, I'm gonna have them write a letter. Well, it's not about an influential person writing a letter, it's about a good letter. And, and only someone who knows you well can write a good letter. So that's my advice around essays and around your letters of recommendation. Hope that helps. 
Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I hope a lot of us will take that advice from you and get going on writing our personal statements as how you said we should write it and not how they want to write it. So thank you so much for that. I'm sure it will be really useful to some of us over here. And keep in mind, there are so many wonderful colleges and universities in the United States. Stanford is one of them, but we have 3000. And that means the top ones are about 150 colleges and universities. So don't be daunted by the fact that some seem impossible to get into. Those aren't the only ones you should be interested in. You know, make sure you're casting a wide net. All right, so uh, the next person to ask the question over here is Alicia. So Alicia, since you're a writer, you can go ahead with your question. Um, hi, Joey. Um, I have a couple of questions to ask you, but before that, I just have to say your words are really inspirational because you actually recalled a few memories of mine and um, you were such an iconic figure and um, I truly admire you and your, this, your story is just so, it actually, it's heartbreaking because it still happens today and it makes me feel so sad because it did happen to one of my friends and it still, it still hurts, but um. The first question I would like to ask you is this that, um, so when I was little in primary school, one of my friends, she was a dark color and people just, you know, looked at her in like a really good way, even though we're living in Dubai and it's a quite a tall country, but you know, people didn't give her the respect she deserved. She was, she was like, no one told her on her face, okay, you're, you um, discriminated her on her face, but you know, they did talk behind her back. And I really heard because I, I felt so heartbroken and, um, she didn't have a voice to kind of speak out and be like, you know what, I am, I am a person. I, I have a life. I, it doesn't matter what color I, I, that's God's choice. Like I did not choose to be brown or I didn't choose to be white. You can't tell me that. And, you know, I really want to know what advice would you give to people who uh, go through the same phase, like who are not able to hear their own voice. That's like, it's, it's held within them, but you just can't get it out, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm so glad that you are her friend is my first thought. Um, I wrote, this is my, uh, this book came out in 2017. It's called Real American. And that's me when I was a baby. <laughs> um, look at angry. Look, I already know something's up. I know that something is up. I called it Real American because too often the narrative in my country is uh, real Americans are the white people and the rest of us, they think are not. So I was reclaiming that term. So number one, I'm glad your friend has you. Number two, we all are desperately hungry to be seen and to know we matter, not to everybody. We just need, even one friend can make such a difference. So um, if you can be, if we can all be that friend um, that someone else needs to sit down and say, you know what? you are beautiful. I don't care what these other people say. You are beautiful. You matter to me. I love being friends with you. Um, that person, she is just looking, she needs a safe space where she can be herself. We all do. And the older we get, the more in charge we are of where am I going to live so that I can feel not just safe, but cherished. We actually want to feel cherished. We want to know that our family members cherish us, our friends cherish us. We want to be in workplaces and in neighborhoods where all right, cherish is maybe too big a word for strangers, like, you know, in the community, but like, we want to be accepted, not just tolerated, right? We want to be embraced. We want to feel a sense of belonging. And we can offer that to each other with eye contact and a smile and just a deep, engaged conversation about how are you? How's life? You know, let's talk. I want to get to know you better, you know, um, deepening those human connections one by one is the way to heal the world is one way to heal the world. Um, so let's all show up um, as good friends for everybody, seeing everybody as if they are our brother, our sister, our, uh, our own selves um, that, you know, can really begin to make all the difference. Thank you so much, Julie. I think all of us here who have had past experiences or friends who've gone through this would have definitely taken something from you. I'm pretty sure if my friend was here today and she heard you speak about all of this, she would have definitely benefited from this. And um, I speak for everyone that, you know, we should for, you know help the ones who are vulnerable to all these issues. I mean, that's what humanity is all about. We have to help 
each other, you know, overcome these issues because the society has a mental state of, you know, just comparing and creating divisions, which is not what we're supposed to do. Because at the end of the day, we're we're gonna we're gonna have to leave the world one day, and we have to create bonds between humans and not create divisions. And that's not what we're supposed to do. So I think each one of us here have to, you know, lend a helping hand and stay beside them when they need us. And that's the only way to overcome this problem. So thank you so much, Yoli. Absolutely. Wow, I immensely want to thank you, Judy, for your efforts towards our event. The way how you talk and the elegance of your explanation really grappled me till the very end. And I was certainly inspired by all what you've covered today. And with that, I need to, I need to mention my deepest sense of appreciation. I extend my thanks to you for your enormous contribution towards making our event a success. And I wish you the very best in all your future endeavors. Thank you so much, Hamza, Nicole, everybody, Karsten, um, everybody who's here. I really appreciate having been invited. I think you're doing an amazing event and I'm honored to have been invited. I'm popping my website in the chat in case you wanna follow me, um, uh, please do. I would love to be in touch. I would love to be a part of your journey. Um, and I'm putting in my social, that's my social everywhere. Not yet TikTok because I'm too old, but you know, maybe one day. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, thanks a lot, Julie, for coming. Thanks.